Thank you, Chris, and good evening to all of you. If you are having, are you able to hear me OK? Sound is fine. So let's make sure we give props to the sound person, taking advice from David. Uh, 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 so if you are not able to understand me, that's not because of the sound person. That's because of my fantastic Indian accent. And there is absolutely nothing I can do about that. So I'm sorry if you can't understand me, OK? All right, terrific. Uh, thank you, Chris, for inviting me to be here. It's a pleasure and honor to be with all of you. And as I walked around the room in the beginning and got to know some of you, I realized that pretty much everyone in this room knows Chris, OK? Pretty much everyone. And she reminded me of that character in Malcolm Gladwell's book, Tipping Point. He defines different characteristics of people. And she reminds me of uh, the connectors. Connectors, right? Guilty, right? Terrific. Thank you. Uh, as you can see here, I, wear, I have the privilege of serving as the chief information officer at Wichita State University, or CIO. And uh, the CIO hat that I have, the CIO hat that I wear, is the most recent occurrence. I want to share with you what I used to do before I was the CIO. Uh, I actually used to be about seven feet tall, <laughs> and I played uh, as a center for Los Angeles Lakers. <laughs> and then I got into the area of information technology, and this happened. <laughs> I was not prepared for change. I wasn't sure what hit me. I wondered. I asked. And it was right in front of me, and I didn't see it. The title CIO does not really stand for Chief Information Officer. It stands for career is over. <laughs> and so I have thought about change all along. I have watched young people. I have watched, watched old people. I have watched adults. I have watched every facet of life. I have watched very, very carefully. And uh, try to learn from different areas. And as you hear this music, you may wonder, why is this music here? I'm also worried that she kept, Chris kept, the certified nerd for the last. And so I didn't want it to come across very nerdy. <laughs> so I did what I, I decided to ask my 16-year-old son for advice. I said, Sachin, I want to look cool. What should I do? He said, play some music. Well, the only problem was the music I can relate to, he doesn't. And so when I showed him today, he said, you're playing that music? It was too late to change it. So I said, I'll stick with this music. Anybody re recognize this music? Well, I'm so glad that you did. I'm going to go home and tell Sachin that somebody who's very, very young recognized that music. So I thank you for making me feel cool. I appreciate it. Okay? That's my newest friend in Wichita, by the way. Okay. All right. So what we'll do is, as we go forward, as you notice here, I wear a lot of other hats on Wichita State campus. And there is a reason for that. Remember, career is over. I want to keep my career secure. So I dabble in many, many different things. And one of the things that I'm most proud of is I love teaching. I love interacting with young men and women in my class. I'm blessed to have some of the most brilliant students that Wichita State has to offer in my classes. I learn more from them every day than I can ever teach them. I know that these young men and women are going to be change leaders. They are going to change Kansas. They are going to change world. So the question I ask myself is, what can I do? What can we do to empower these change leaders every day? That's the question I ask myself each and every day. What can we be doing to empower? So what I want to do is seek your help. Because the only way I'm going to be able to match some of our fabulous presenters we had today is with your help. Okay, so I'm going to ask your help as we move forward. So let me switch to the next slide here and think of change. When you think of change, what comes to your mind? What do you think about when you come to change? I've asked this question to a lot of young people in high schools and middle schools and so on. And I ask them, what do you think of change? And the typical response we get is, I get is, oh, whatever, no problem, we can handle it. Young people are so much more uh, adaptable. They can adapt to change much better than at least I can. And perhaps you all can adapt to change very, very well too, but uh, you know, at least I cannot. So let me ask you a simple question, because I wanted to understand change. 
So you're going to have to help me out. Let's do a very, very quick experiment, OK? I'm going to put this clicker down for a second. If you can all take your hands and put it up here like this, please. Can you do that, please? OK, now clap and clasp your, clasp your hands together and let them rest in front of your table, OK, on your table. Keep them together. Now, please take a look at your hands and make the following observations. Do you have your right thumb on the top or the left thumb? Keep it to yourself. Keep that observation to yourself. Right thumb on the top or the left one. Keep that in mind. Okay. Then, once you have done that and noted that observation, go ahead and switch those thumbs, please. Go ahead and switch those thumbs. And stay like that the rest of the presentation. <laughs> no? Okay, tell me why not. It is a very awkward and uncomfortable feeling, isn't it? Okay. Notice a simple change like that is awkward and uncomfortable. Right? Okay, so let me get a poll here and ask you how many of you had your right thumb on the top? Okay, raise your hand, please. And if you want to look around, turn around and look, you can. Okay, there's a few of you. How many of you had your left thumb on the top? Okay, terrific. Now, let me share with you, and there are some psychologists in the house here, and there's a lot of psychology research that's being done, so I'm not a psychologist. So I'm only sharing what I'm reading. And there are lots of different observations about that. People have thought about maybe it's related to right-handed, left-handed. Maybe it's related to genetics. Maybe it's related to something else, left brain, right brain. There are lots of different explanations. But I'll just give you one that I read. The folks who have right thumb on top, had the right thumb on top, are considered sexy. <laughs> I don't know if that's appropriate considering Eric's first uh, uh, idea that Eric had there. Uh, uh, the folks who had, and you can't change now, by the way. The folks, who had, the folks who had left them on the top are considered sneaky. Now, there may be some of you in this room who had neither thumb on the top, side by side. That's possible. There are, there are a few people. One or two percent of the population typically has side by side, just two thumbs. I wonder what those people are. Sneaky and sexy, sneaky while thinking about sex, I'm not really sure, but uh, who knows, okay? But point is, change is a little hard. What I'm going to do is ask you some questions, and I want you to think about what answers you would give to these questions as we have these conversations. I had asked these questions at one of the events recently I was speaking at. This was the Central Association of College and University Business Officers. These were all chief financial officers of many different higher education institutions, and I was having a conversation with them. And I asked some of these questions. So when I talk about, will we be relevant 10 years from now, what I'm really talking about is, as an institution of higher education, Wichita State, or KU, or K-State, or it could apply to your businesses, will you be relevant 10 years from now? And my hypothesis is, if you don't pay attention to changes that are occurring around you, if you do not pay attention to what's happening around you, chances are you will be irrelevant 10 years or sooner, okay, you will be. So let's talk about some of these questions. This was a question I asked of the folks who were at the business meeting there. And be thinking about how you would answer these questions. If you have some young people in your life, ask yourself, how will they answer the question? The business officers who answered this question, that was the result. That was the result they got, okay? Typically, uh, you know, breaking news or some folks looked up online uh, Lou, I'm sorry, but nobody saw it on the newspaper. I apologize, okay? Uh, I wish I could change that. Didn't happen, okay? Uh, and about 9% of them, 9% of them got the information through RSS feed, RSS feed. And that's the beauty, that's the beauty of Web 2.0 world. In Web 2.0 world, you don't have to go and look for information. The information will find you in the topics that you're interested in. The information will find you in the topics that you're interested in. You do not have to look for information. Now, I'm sure there are many of you in this room who are already familiar with it, are aware of it, are using it. But whether you're using it or not, the young people that I interact with every day use this. So the question I have for you, question I have for me as a higher education educator is, how can I leverage that? How can I leverage that mentality to prepare them to be change leaders for tomorrow. These are his feeds. I asked them another question. How would you answer this question? And again, we may have a fairly biased audience here, but this was the response from the business officers as we looked at them. 
about 50% of these, now remember, these are chief financial officers and their colleagues, their associates. About 50% of them were not on any of the social media sites. What do you think will happen if I walked around Wichita State campus, or Mr. Shook is here from East High School, if I walked around East High School and I asked 100 high school students or college students if they use social media, what do you suppose the answer will be? What do you suppose would the percentage be? Could somebody shout it out, please? 100%, okay. I actually did that experiment with about 100 students on Wichita State campus. 99 people were on Facebook. One person who was not on Facebook had just arrived from another country where Orkut, another site, tends to be a little bit more popular and Facebook is getting there. Facebook is getting there. Now, question is, why do we care? Why should we care about this? Is Facebook just a waste of time? Why should we care? We should care because it is about our relevance. Facebook today, Facebook today, has a population of about 800 million people. By August of this year, it is expected that Facebook will cross over a billion people. Over a billion people. If Facebook was a country right now, it's a country of third largest country in the world. 70 different languages spoken, 200 different countries represented, more females than males, very diverse. So the question is, could we use Facebook as a tool in some of our classes? What if in sociology I had a class that said, let's study the culture of Facebook? Will that class perhaps be popular? Will people want to learn more sociology because of that class? That's the question I want to ask before you. That's the question I asked of my colleagues and I said, it is about our relevance. We need to pay attention. We need to use these tools. We need to use these tools. We need to leverage these tools. Taking one step further, very simple question, do you use text messaging? Do you use text messaging? And I asked this question of business officers as well. Uh, lots of them use text messaging. So let's do another quick experiment. Uh, you got, got your cell phones, smartphones with you? Do you have them? Can you take them out, please, if it's possible quickly? Here's what I want you to do. Uh, now that you've taken the cell phone out, uh, if you have, uh, talk to the person next to you, uh, reach out to the person next to you, and as long as they look semi-trustworthy, go ahead and exchange your phone. Go ahead and exchange your phone. Go ahead. I've only done this a couple of times, and we haven't lost that many phones, so. <laughs> I've done it only a few times. We haven't lost that many phones. We should be all right. Now, here are some of the things that are happening in the room. People are going, is he crazy? <laughs> the other people are maybe going, I just got a very nice upgrade. <laughs> I always wanted that iPhone 4, right? Uh, now, but the key thing is, I did this one time in one of the presentations, and I forgot to tell people to take it back, give it back, uh, for a long time. And I could almost see the anxiety in the room starting to go up. <laughs> like, is he, so before the anxiety goes up and you push me out of this room, let's go ahead and give our phones back to each other, please. Okay, all right, thank you, thank you. Now that feels a lot better, right? We can all breathe, it's okay, you got your phone back. Okay. Now how did that feel when you didn't have your phone, your special device with you? Did it feel a little bit uncomfortable trying to hand over your device? The question I have for you is this. Why is it then, why is it then, that when my young people come to my class, to our high schools, that we tell them to turn off their device instead of using that device as an educational tool? We should be able to use that to, uh, as an educational tool. And I know some schools are starting to move towards that. I know in East High School, at least, they are starting to use um, cell phones as an, smartphones as an educational tool. What is wrong? In, even if you want to study World War I history, and no offense if you served in World War War, but the point is, uh, before studying history, if the goal is to get people to like history, wouldn't it be interesting to also get people to study the history of Google or the history of Facebook, and then use that, those tools, to study the history of World War I, two, three, whatever you want to talk about? We can do that, right? So my point is, we need to use these as, as educational tools Otherwise, it is about our relevance. If we don't do that, chances are we are going to be irrelevant. And you know, when you bring these ideas out, there are always some people who are going to oppose this. There are always going to be some people who are not going to like these ideas. Uh, those are the cave people, as you know. <laughs> Colleagues against virtually everything. And, 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 
And the way, and the way I look at them is, uh, they are going to be irrelevant. I'm going to get on my bus. We're going to move on. We're going to get things done that we need to get things done. <laughs> Let's talk about library and books. We ask this question. And by the way, I'm not against library. I love librarians. Uh, I used to be the interim dean of the library for a couple of years, so I understand. But this was the response. This was the response, OK? Library has turned from a place where you check out a book to more of a gathering place, place for collaboration, place for exchanging ideas. And who better to tell us that than what happened with books and the disruptive technology? Once upon a time, there was Gutenberg Press. I'm sure nobody in this room remembers it. Lou? Uh, I'm just checking. Yeah. Lou gets this because he said I speak very fast. There you go, Lou. That's just for you. Okay. <laughs> Gutenberg Press. Then we had the modern printing. Then we, of course, had Kindle and Amazon had to come along. And I'm sure everybody in this room has bought something on Amazon, right? Something, right? You know, Amazon is such a beautiful thing. Valentine's Day is coming, okay, in case you had forgotten. If you have significant other in your life, uh, what's beautiful about Amazon is Amazon knows, Amazon knows what my wife likes better than I do. <laughs> Ever since I started buying things on Amazon for her, every time the gift has been perfect. Amazon is never wrong. So I, I can vouch for that. My wife can vouch for that. She has gotten gifts that she loves. Here's what the publishing industry is going through. This is what it looks like. Look at the model at the bottom there. It costs Amazon six cents, six cents to download the book to your Kindle, to your iPad, to your whatever device, six cents. The supply chain up there on the top part cannot compete with that bottom. It's an unsustainable business model. That's a market transition we need to pay attention to. Let's talk about TV and cable industry. How do you watch your favorite shows? Be thinking about how you would answer this question and that was the response. That was the response from different business officers. I want to focus on that other 6%. What is that other 6% doing? There you go. Thank you for pointing that out. That's my second best friend in Wichita now. Okay? Uh, so let's talk about uh, our supply chain here. I looked at, they took the example of Cox, or you know, Cox, we do, are good friends of ours. We have Cox at home. And typically, that's our model. We have a self, we have our landline, we have our broadband, and we possibly have your cable TV at our home, right? But something happened to that model along the way. And I assume that each of that cost $33 just to kind of give us an idea, okay? So the smartphones came along. And many people did what? Cut off their landline. If I'm Cox, I just lost $33 in revenue. Then something else happened. The cable TV gone, the Hulu came along, where I watch shows on demand. And why is this relevant to us? This is relevant to us because if I'm a higher education institution, if I'm not paying to what's happening around me, and if I'm not properly changing my marketing classes, my communication classes, my broadcast journalism classes, I have a problem. I may become irrelevant. I may not have time for the media. Do we have? A couple of more, two more minutes, okay, all right. So we look at the music, music and the music industry. I'm sure nobody here, including Lou, knows about those old tapes that we used to have, discs we used to have, rotated at 33 RPM speed and so on. The interesting thing about that is, if you wanted to listen to that music, you had to have that disc. You couldn't do anything about it. But something interesting happened along the way. Eventually, the music got digitized, and movement music got digitized, you cut the cord. You cut the cord. The moment music got digitized, we cut the cord. And why am I talking about that? What's happening is, is a total digital conversion. Any time, any device, any place, any content, 24-7 access, complete digital conversions. I'm here to argue that even in education and higher education, that's what our young people are looking for a complete higher education convergence. And if we cannot provide that to them, then we have a problem of being relevant. We have a problem of relevance. That's what we are looking at. So what I'll do is I'll wrap this up and skip through the slides on gaming that I had. I had some interesting slides on gaming. I may just show you a couple of faces. What do you think that face is from? From a person playing a video game, not from a person who is in my class, OK? <laughs> Look at that face there. 
Look at that joy. And what I'm arguing is many young people, many young people by age 21 have paid, played 10,000 hours or more of gaming. They already have. When I showed that to a slide to a young student in my office, she worked for me, she said, I was wrong. She reached that milestone at age 19. That's what she told me, this young lady. So why, why do we care? Well, we should explore learning through gaming. We should explore learning through gaming. If you're looking at just a report that came out yesterday, the federal government has a person who's looking at that where they want to make tons of money available. But if you, so when your children are playing those games, when your children are playing video games, it's not that they're wasting time. I want you to get involved in those games. Learn those games. Those games require tremendous amount of understanding and creativity. Those games have a built-in assessment. You cannot go to level 15 if you have not completed level 14. <laughs> you just can't. They collaborate. They talk to friends all over the world through Facebook. Well, how did you break that level? There is a collaboration going on. Interesting things are happening in the game world, so I submit to you, take a look at that. Participate, play those games with your young children. You're probably going to lose for a while. If you have not played before, that's OK. And I'm going to wrap that up by showing this video. It's a 40-second video. Go ahead, please. Can you hit the play? I want to conclude by saying that I'm not saying let's throw technology at every problem. Technology is never, never going to replace our outstanding teachers and scholars that we have at Wichita State and in our high schools and other places. What technology is going to do is empower these outstanding teachers to reach and connect with many more students than perhaps currently possible. Very much like what we are trying to do today is to connect with each other and learn from each other. Thank you for giving me a couple of extra more minutes. I appreciate your time. Thank you.